We're recording. Okay. So I want to, uh, today we're going to go on with operating system security. We're going to kind of go deeper. Um, and in particular, one of the things I want to focus on is what are sort of the vulnerabilities in operating system security? And go beyond just what are the mechanisms, but where do the mechanisms break and how have they had to be fixed? Because I think that's important for security, not just to know what happens, but how do these, these plans that look very good actually not work? So I want to go a little bit more into detail into password checking because there were some confusions last time. Um, so the problem we were going through was checking a password for validity. And so the natural thing to do is you take your password, you call stirconf on your password. Stirconf compares two strings character by character. As soon as it finds a, a different character, it will return uh, an error saying these things don't match. Um, and so return a non-zero number, and so you know that, that it missed. So how do you do this to figure out a password? So what you do is you lay out, you have some password you want to check against, foobar, you lay out your trial password, which is all A's, and you put the first character on a good page in memory, and you put all the other characters on bad pages in memory. So this means that if the password checking program accesses those bad pages, it'll take a page call to return an error. If we do this, we will get a bad password kick error because we will see when we do the start comp comparing F to A, it will say these don't match and it will return bad password. If, however, on the sixth try we try an F, then start comp will say, oh, F and F are the same, let's now compare O against A. However, when it accesses the A, it'll take a page fault and it'll either fail somehow or it'll return bad parameters. So we know in this case, because we didn't get that password, we know that the Fs match. So when we have done this with just six tries, we figured out one character. So we do the same thing again. We slide our bad, our good data over one more. Now we try Fa, and we're going to again going to get bad password. Well, on the 15th try, we're going to try Fo, and it's, we're going to get bad parameter again because we access the invalid memory. So what this means is that for each character in your password, if it's all lowercase letters, it only takes 26 tries. So if there's six characters in your password, it takes 26 times six tries to get, figure out what your password is. You know, so ultimately, when we do this the last time, after 156 tries, rough, you know, at most, we're going to figure out a, a six-character password. Right? This is going to take like a millisecond on a fast computer. So not very secure at all. Any questions on this now? Hopefully this is more clear. Yes? How do you ensure that the extra character comes from the back page? So as a programmer, you can use virtual memory primitives like mmap and mprotect. So you can uh, call mprotect and make a page of memory in your address space invalid. Um, or when you allocate memory, you can allocate memory and allocate, say, uh, allocate, say, 16K of virtual memory. And the operating system won't allocate beyond that 16K region, so you just put your password right at the very end of that 16K. And whatever's after that, you haven't allocated, so there's nothing there. And so that ensures that those addresses are bad addresses. So the better way to do this, I mentioned before, is to hash things. And so in this case, this cryptographic hash, where we hash the password, will um, read all the characters of the password. If there's any invalid memory, we'll detect it during the cryptographic hash. So what this means now is you now need to guess all six characters at the same time. So the complexity of this is the number of characters raised to the number of letters in your password. So for six characters, there's potentially 308 million different passwords. So you can see why this is slightly more secure than the other way of doing things and why people do it this way. Right? Because this could actually take like two seconds to work out on a fast computer, maybe 15 seconds or 20 seconds, not just a millisecond. Okay? Um, so, we're going to back into access control mechanisms. So, this is where we ended last time. Just going to do a quick. Whoops. Oop, I can't go backwards, I guess. So, no question. I can't go. Because I'm recording, I can't go backwards and record previous slides. So, uh, you'll have to bear with me. Um, okay, so previously we had talked about the notion of an access control matrix.
And we talked about how you could represent this as an access control list, which said for every object, we we're going to store the permissions. Or we could represent it as a capability list, capability where we say for every user, what are the things you have access to? And we said that, you know, the difference is here you're sort of storing a list of things on every object. If you have a million objects, you have a lot of lists because you have to have a list on each one. And you have to still have some way to sort of search this list every time you want to access something. In this case, for every user, we have some list of things they can open. And when you want to open things, you've got to search the list of uh, permissions that you have here, or tokens or capabilities that you have to find the one for the appropriate object. So there's slightly different complexities based on how many objects you can access. Um, so we went through some of the differences uh, in what they do, and we'll sort of move on now. So here is sort of a real example from my laptop of Unix. So Unix uses uh, access control lists for files. So every file on the left here has an access control list. And what it says is, what permission do different users have or different groups have to this file? You've probably all seen this before. So the way to interpret this, the first character says, is it a directory or not? It then has three letters, W, X, and R, which says, what is the owner of the file to? So in Unix or Linux or Mac OS, the owner, the person who created the file, has special permissions. One, they can always change the access control list to add or remove things, um, but they can sort of set their, so, and they have their own permissions. The reason for this is you might, as a user, want to have private files nobody else can access, so it's good to say, what can that user do? Um, second, there's a group, so you can put a group on files. We'll talk about that in a bit. In this case, the group, you can see up there, the, uh, there's a column Swift, which is the user, and staff, which is the group, and it says what access the group gets. And then there's a set for all. Everybody else who is not the user or the group gets the remaining permissions. Yes? Uh, can you, out of curiosity, can you create new types of, uh, I don't know, what you call these like classes, like, for example, we're at a university, so could you make one called student, and they can only interact with certain actors from professors and certain Yes, yeah, so in the computer science group department, every class has a group for all the students in that class. And so if I want to give permissions just to you, there is a group, I can put a group on a file that says 642SP19 has access to read these files. And that would mean you could read them, but students not in the class could not read them. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get a little bit more about sort of the details of this. So it turns out that Unix and Linux and Mac OS also use capabilities. And almost every operating system uses a mix of both. So the way Unix and, and Windows and Mac and everything use capabilities is that when you open a file, you do an access control check. So the operating system will look at your user ID, your group memberships, and decide do you have access. Once you've opened the file, it will give you a capability called a handle or a file descriptor for that file that is currently open. So when you want to do anything else to that file after you've opened it, you can use the capability. So the reason to do this is that it's very fast because remember it's like the idea is you just have a key and you check does it actually open the door or not. You don't have to look through a list and decide are you a member of a group or not. Um, and the other thing you can do with capabilities is I can pass them. So I can take a capability and I can pass it to a process that you are running. So if I want to let you have access to one of my files, I can open it and then I can send you a capability. Uh, this file descriptor or handle for that, you can then use that file descriptor to read and write the file. So here are some codes um, using Unix domain sockets where you can send messages. One of the message um, types, one of the things you can send in a message is you can send a descriptor. Um, so it's passing, in this case, a socket, a network socket to some other process, so that other process can use the socket to send and receive data. So this is what's nice about capabilities, is it's easy to delegate, that if I have access, I can open the file, create a capability, I can then give it to anybody else that I want to have access to that. In contrast, if I wanted to give you access to a file using access control lists, I would have to have the permission to modify that access control list and grant you access. 
And in Unix or Linux or Mac OS, only the owner of the file can change the permissions and the root or administrator of the operating system. So this means that if you have read access, you can't take your read access and grant read access to someone else by changing the access control. So that might be a good thing because I might not want you to if it's my file, but it might be a bad thing because you want it. So there's sort of a policy question there. Any questions? Yes? You're saying file descriptors aren't they per process? So file descriptors are per process, so what you are doing is actually you're copying the capability from one process to another and creating a copy of that capability in the other process that grants the same access to the same file or the same topic. So in, um, in Windows, the, the system call is duplicate handle, and you say which process you want to duplicate it into because you were creating a copy of it for some other process. You're absolutely right. You're not giving it away because you still have it, you're just making a new copy. Okay. So, there's a question of revocation. If I don't want you to have access anymore, what do I do? So for access control lists, you remove a user or group or you change the permission for everybody. In Unix and whatnot, there is a command chmod, change mode, where you can remove access. So here uh, on the third line, it says chmod g minus r pg11. Um, g means I want to change the permission for group. So you can see at the top, group has read access. I'm removing read access. And then lower down below, you can see that group does not have read access. Uh, so one question is, suppose you were in the staff group here, what would happen when you open this file now? So staff is granted, was granted read access, now it has no access. What do you think will happen if somebody in the staff group tries to read this file? Any thoughts? Will it get access or will it not get access? What? It won't be able to access. Why not? So it says up there, all users, that third R says all users get read access. So you're saying the people in the staff group that will not get read access. They will? I trick you, they won't. Um, so in Unix, what happens is if you're a member of the group, you get that group access and nothing else. So it means that you can actually deny access to a file to a group of users. So if I wanted to create a file with solutions for this class, and I wanted to prohibit any of you from seeing it, I could create a file, grant all users read access, grant myself read write access, and grant 642 no access. And then you couldn't see the file, but all your friends could. So it's kind of a peculiarity, but um, it could be useful in some cases. So in capabilities, there's a question, how do you revoke a capability? Because a capability is sort of this token that you're passing around to someone. Um, and you know it's a lot like a physical key where you give it to someone. So with physical keys, how do you revoke a physical key? One, you have to track down the person with the key and either ask them for it politely or beat them up until they give it to you. Um, or you can change the locks, which means nobody who got access could get it. So in that case, you could sort of, uh, for example, if we wanted, if we had a capability to this file, we could we could copy the file to a new location delete the old file so the old capability or handle to it didn't do anything anymore. Um, so the other thing that people do sometimes is they add a layer of indirection. So this is, if you've taken operating systems, you know this is the solution to all problem. So if we have a file, and we have a capability to that file that I've given away, and I want to revoke it later, I can, when I give away that capability, I can actually give away a capability to a proxy that actually holds a capability to that file. So we're basically having a double indirect pointer here. And if I want to revoke that capability, I can sort of revoke the capability from this proxy. And so what this means though is you can sort of guess this is extra overhead, it is extra slowdown, it's extra complexity. So in general, people don't deal with revocation of capabilities. You use it um, when you're not worried about that. A third thing you can do is you can make them time out. You can say this capability is only good for 10 minutes, 
After that, you need to go get a new one um, in some cases. Again, that's complex because you have to have some way of getting a new one. Any questions on revocation? We will see this again later, by the way, when we get to public keys and encryption. Yes? So I'm guessing you're doing this all in the role of an administrator or something like that? So uh, typically, although these mechanisms are designed so that normal users, as a user, you can set access control lists on your files. You can give out file descriptors. Um, you might want to give a file descriptor to him to access your file or something like that, and then revoke it later. So it's not only administrators who want to do this. So would you be able to give out this rule for accessing, or like certain subsections of your files? Like if you wanted your TAs, for example, to be able to manage some of your files, would you be able to create roles within here that allow them to do that? So what I could do is I could um, I could create a group, 642 TAs, and let me think. It would the there is a the challenge is that. There is not a way in Unix to have two groups. So if I want to have a group for students who can read a file, for TAs who can read and write a file, and for myself who is sort of the owner of the file, I can't do that in Unix because I have two groups of users and they want different access. In Windows, you, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you can do that. You can have any number of groups. You can have like a thousand different groups listed on a file with different access if you want. But only you as the user can change who has access so to the in, in Unix, the only people who can change permissions on a file are whoever's listed as the owner, which the person created the file, or somebody with root access. In Windows, there's not just read, write, execute. There is a permission, write, ACL, uh, which allows you to say who can change the access control list. And so in Windows, you could, and I could, in fact, create a file and then give the TAs the permission to change the permission on the file. So it's a much more complete access control system, but much more complicated. OK, so if you go on a security, you will see capabilities over and over and over again. And people building secure systems absolutely love them. If you look at some of the most secure operating systems out there, they're typically built around capabilities. Um, and one reason is that checking permissions with a capability can be very fast because typically it's encoded as sort of a table lookup or it's encoded as a pointer that you're just dereferencing a pointer, so it ends up being very fast. Um, and you can also look at a you can look at a program that's running and see, oh, it has six capabilities, there's six things it can access. It's very easy to figure out what you can access. In contrast, think about a multi-terabyte file system and figuring out what files you can access. You have to look at every single file on that file system to figure out what you access. So it can be more complicated for some users. Um, so there's a bunch of research operating systems that were built around capabilities. There's an operating system called Mock that is now sort of part of the basis for Mac OS that was built internally using some capability technology. Google is building a new operating system for mobile devices called Fuchsia that is based around capabilities. Um, and as I mentioned, it's sort of, it is used in mainstream systems. Um, and it's really used for this sort of flexible use where you want to sort of take permissions and grant them to someone else temporarily. Okay, so I've touched a little bit on groups, uh, but the idea with groups is that we want to sort of not just think about users in the world, we want to have more flexible ways of reasoning about group of people. And a generalization of this is this notion of a role. And that as a person, you may play multiple roles in your organization that should grant you access to different things. So for example, I'm a professor, so that means that um, I should have access to uh, internal documents around faculty hiring. I am the instructor for this class, so I should have access to documents relating to this class. I'm on the Letters and Sciences Equity and Diversity Committee, so I should have access to our internal documents about what we're doing to increase diversity in Letters and Sciences. Um, I am an advisor to um, SACM and to the Hub, and so again, I have access for this. So I play multiple different roles as a, for the different things that I do in my job. Um, I also am an administrator on my laptop, and so in some places, I have more privileges than others. So the idea of a role sort of separates out uh, the notion of who gets access from a particular user. It says that people playing this role have access. 
So it's nice, for example, in our department, we can say the systems lab has access to administer our machines. When they hire people or those people quit, they can add people to that group or remove them, and so we don't have to keep track of all the users. We can just say anybody who works in CSL gets to manage these machines. So you're sort of adding a layer of indirection between the humans who can do things and the role of, that they play. Um, so this is sort of a very powerful idea. In Linux, there's sort of a flat list of groups, and when you log in, there's a file that says all the groups you're a member of and all that information is stored. When you access a file, it'll look through a list of all the groups you're a member of and see are any of these listed on that access control list for the file. Um, in Windows, you can actually have nested groups. So you can be in a group that has other groups as members, uh, you know, arbitrarily deep. So you can have a, a list of like all students in every class and then all students might be comprised of all the classes. And so you can nest groups to get fancier structures. Yes? Uh, is the ACL no. So the, a, the ACL is just stored on your file system with everything else. The ACL is typically, is often public information. But remember that the a directory itself is an object that you can control access to. If you don't want someone to see the ACL because you're worried about disclosing who has access to this information, then you can make the directory itself not accessible. If you don't have access to a directory, then you can't see all the files in it and see the permissions on those files. Okay, so um, we covered this already. So I want to touch now on Windows file permissions because Windows is really a generalization of what Unix can do in a pretty rich way. So Windows has a data structure called an access control list. Um, and this is a data structure that is used by the file system for every file and directory. It's used by the operating system kernel. Every object in Windows has an access control list on it. Every process, every thread, every memory map region, every mutex, every event, every device driver, um, every socket has a file descriptor on it and that has an access control list on it that can be used to grant access. So if I want to open your process, for example, to read memory from your process, I can say open process, provide a process ID. The kernel will say, look at the access control list and say, do you have access? So it is a uniform way of applying permissions to everything in Windows. It's also accessible as a library um, so that as an application, you can use the same data structure and the same mechanisms to implement access control. So thinking back to the um, principles of a secure system design, does this remind you of any of those principles? I know it was a while ago, and it was a pretty abstract list, but can you think back to that list of how that list might relate to having a common access control mechanism everywhere? Yeah. It's probably related to availability, right? Um, it relates somewhat to availability, but that was sort of a, a security goal. It wasn't, we had these principles for secure system design, but there are eight different principles. Any thoughts? Yeah. Separation of privileges? Um, a little bit of separation. Well, separation of privileges, the idea there was that you needed two people to, or two entities to collaborate to do things. And Windows does not, I'll sort of talk about that hopefully later today, but this mechanism alone doesn't provide separation of privileges. Yeah. Uh, least required privilege. So least required privilege, it's a little closer because um, we can have finer grain privilege. We can sort of slice and dice users into different groups and only give them the access they need. But there's more ideas in the back. Uh, economy of mechanism. So there is a point that is trying to have one access control mechanism that everybody uses. And that means that we are not having, hopefully, every application invent its own mechanism and do it poorly. So that is one aspect of this, of having a system facility for doing this. Yeah. Open design. Um, open design, not so much, because Microsoft never published. Actually, they have, I don't think they've ever published this code. But the one I was thinking of, and I will admit that I always hated when professors did a fishing expedition like this, where they had some obscure point, and they were trying to like find a brilliant student or lucky student who figured that thing out. The thing I was thinking about was complete mediation. That the idea is we have one mechanism and we're going to use it to mediate or to control access to every single kind of object in the system. And in fact, Microsoft went so far as to name the access control code the reference monitor 
which is the terminology used in that paper uh, on how to build secure systems. So the reference monitor actually, actually has a routine NT check access that takes an access control list um, and checks it for access. Okay, so inside the access control list, there's a size, there's a revision because they might have different versions. You have a count of access control entries, and each access control entry um, lets you either grant access to a user group or deny access. So one of the things you can do is you can explicitly say, I grant everybody in the world access except for Bob, because I don't like Bob. Or we fired Bob today, so we're gonna, we're gonna not let Bob have access. Um, so you can explicitly revoke access by putting an entry into an access control list in Windows. Um, the other thing you can do, uh, the other thing about this to know is that the way access control works is that you say what permissions you need. So I would say, I want read, write, execute permissions. The routine will walk through the list of ACEs, of entries in here, and figuring out do, do, does, it, does each ACE grant me the access I want or not, or does it deny me the access I want, and it will stop as soon as either any of the rights that I want are denied, or when I get all the access I need. Even if there's an ACE later down that denies me one of those accesses, it looks at, it matters what order they're in. So it just starts at the top and works its way down. So that's one interesting thing. The other thing in here is that Apple's access controls in Linux say explicitly how things are inherited. You can put access, you can put entries in an access control list that actually don't control access, but they're explicitly meant for directories to say if you create a file in this directory, what is the default access control list on that file? So these are what are called inherited ACEs that you see at the bottom there in the table. So the idea is I can say when I create a file in this directory, I want to have the default be that it's private to me. Even if the default everywhere else is the files are public, in this directory, files should default to private. And you do that by setting these, creating these entries that are inherited. So quick question here. Suppose you wanted to implement Unix style access control lists. How might you do it in this mechanism? Any thoughts? Yes? Uh, I use inherited. Uh, why? Because then it's just uh, based on the file or based on where the file is. Okay, so that's, uh, so, so by default inherited, so inherit from the directory. So what would actually go into the access control entries? Like, what would the entries that we have be to get the semantics of a Unix style access control? Yes? Can we just make three ACEs, one for the user, the mm -hmm. one for the group that you're giving permission to, and one for everyone else? Okay. Uh, so that, that would get close. Uh, so the problem is, remember, there is this, so the idea is we're going to have one. Ace for user, one for the group, one for everyone else, and grant them access. Remember, there's a problem though that if you're a member of the group and get read access and everyone gets read write access, you don't get read write access, you get read access. So we need to make sure that if you're a, that you only get your permissions and nothing else. So how can we do that? How can we add that feature in using these using this Apple style? So the way to think about it is what I'm saying is that if you're a member of a group, you should get the permissions for the group and you should be denied all other permissions because that's all you get. And so what you would do is you would have an access allowed ace for the group saying you get read access, then an access denied group for the group for the uh, for the group saying you're denied all other accesses. So this means that if you're asking for read, when you get there, you'll get read. If you ask for anything else, you will immediately fail and be kicked out. Um, and so the same thing is for the user, for the owner, you would have an access allowed ace for that owner, and then an access denied ace for the owner, denying all other um, access control. Um, so the nice thing is that it's, sort of, it's a flexible enough system that lets you emulate other styles of access control. Now, one quick challenge here is that it's so complicated that Microsoft has never built a user interface that actually uses the full, that can actually show the full capabilities or the full features of this. Because, like, figuring out if you have a complex set of, act, of, of entries and deny 
uh, ACES, it's very hard to figure out who actually has access control. So the user interface has a much simpler stripped down version. 